that we, we research and write about and that of course we also use as writers and we were talking a lot about character development over the last few months and I thought, oh that's right, let's do something on character development. And so the hero and anti-hero and villain walk into the bar was what we came up with. This is how it's how we described it. Your main cast of characters should be well developed and multifaceted. Each one has a journey and a backstory. Let's break down character archetypes and explore the ways to bring depth and complexity to these fictional personalities. What are you doing, Heather? <laughs> the mic's on, it's just really low. Join this lively conversation as we examine existing pop culture heroes, anti-heroes, and villains and discuss ways to breathe life into our own characters. So that's what we came up with at 7.30 in the morning, the morning of the Comic-Con when we thought it was nine. Before we begin, I will let my illustrious panelists introduce themselves, and then I will shoot them a couple of questions to get things started. And then I would like to open it up um, for you guys to ask any questions that you want to ask. Uh, more of a lively discussion. Mike? Hi, I'm uh, Mike Squadrito. I'm the community and the floor. Hello, hello. Pull, pull, pull the mic right into your like this. I don't know, talk right into it. Hello. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Uh, Mike Squadrito. I'm the author of the Overwatch Fantasy Book Series. Uh, it's a four book saga, and my latest book came out in September, which wraps up the whole storyline. So it's not going to be like Game of Thrones, where they went one direction and the other one didn't finish. So. Um, I'm also the vice president of the Association of Rhode Island Authors and the Expo Chairman, chairman um, for this event. So I've been doing a lot this year. And that's about me. And I'll uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Benicia. You got to go like this, Chris. Fantasy writer. Uh, I have, yep, our ours are not on, so we're going to kind of yell. So <laughs> I apologize ahead of time. Uh, but in uh, in my travels as a uh, military person, I did pararescue in the United States Air Force. Uh, I've come across a lot of interesting topics to write about. Oh, oh here we go. All right. Yay. Uh, so I, I've come across uh, some pretty cool, interesting topics to write about, and uh, Ancient Aliens is a, is a big topic of mine. Uh, my current series, the Haven series, is based in that, Ancient Aliens, and uh, my premise is that the Ancient Aliens have never left. They're right here amongst us. Let's see if my... Oh, it works! <laughs> Thanks, Rob! Volunteer uh, of the year over there. Uh, my name is Heather Rigby, and I am an author as well. That's why I'm here. And <laughs> we have um, even a drink. <laughs> yes, I have not had a drink yet today. <laughs> um, so this is this is my the trilogy that I wrote. It takes place in Patuxent Village, where we are right now, and there's actually a scene in this building. Um, I'm a historical fantasy writer. I do a lot of research, um, and I've tried to tie as many nautical events that I could find in Narragansett Bay into the books, and um, as well as Irish folklore. So, folklore and history are kind of the things that inform my writing, and uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. And I'm Tabitha Moore, and I'm the author of the Horizon series. Of course, now hers is not working. <laughs> All right, we fixed one, like and this. then. <laughs> I'm just going to hold it right here. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Nice. A little uncomfortable, but we're going to go with it. Um, I wrote the Horizon series. Uh, the series also, like my mother, is done, complete. Um, I bring some short fiction and podcast fiction, and I'm working on an urban fantasy right now. I'm also the managing editor for the Inkling Writers Blog and the um, 
part, a partner at the Club Babylon doing interviews and writer interviews mostly and reviews. So anyway, I'm going to throw some questions out to these guys about character development, and we're sticking with the big three: the hero, the anti-hero, and the villain. For now, um, you can sort of main cast of characters in genre fiction often. And so, um, my first question to just kind of make us laugh a little and warm us up is: All right. Darth Vader, Han Solo, and Luke walk into a bar. What do they drink, and why? <laughs> We're gonna go with Heather first. On this. Okay. Been thinking so, about this. I have. I've been thinking about this all morning. So Luke Skywalker would have blue milk with no alcohol because he's a weenie, and then Han Solo would definitely have scotch on the rocks because he's classy, and Darth Vader would have ethanol with a straw. <laughs> Anyway, you know, we don't have to. If you have an answer for that, we can, but I just get off for you. Is mine off too? I don't know. I'm talking right into it. No, I, th I think you're right with Han Solo getting scotch or whiskey. And I think Luke would have maybe a Coke. And then uh, Doc would have something with flames. Yeah. Hello, I'm back. Flames. Well, and for me, I think they're all, I think they're all going to have shots of fireballs. So. <laughs> There you go. Okay, good. We're good. Yep, we're good. Thank you, sir. Rob, you win. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, stick around. Don't leave us, Rob. <laughs> Something might go terribly awry. <laughs> okay, so I want to just talk a little bit about the qualities of these characters the hero, the anti hero, and the villain. So, Mike, when you're constructing, let's begin with a villain. When you're making a villain in your mind, what are some of the things you think about when you're, when you're building that character? And why are they important to you as a writer, and why will they be important to the readers later on? Okay, um, villain. The villain. So when I when I write my bad guys, uh, obviously they have an agenda um, to either get what the the good guys want or to stop them from getting what they want. So it, it depends on the character themselves if they're going to be like wicked evil, not like prince and wicked, but wicked <laughs> and, and evil. Um, that's one different way, but in my storyline I have multiple bad guys, and I have one who's Nigel Hammer, and he's just manipulates everybody. Like my main character is a righteous warrior, and if he confronts him without a weapon, he's like, well, you can't, you can't kill me, because I'm, I don't have a weapon that goes against what you do. And he's just a manipulator that way. So, it all depends on what you're trying to convey and how you want that bad guy to be, which I think is a lot of fun because a lot of times you focus so much on your good characters and their goal, but there's got to be an obstacle somewhere. And your bad guys have a backstory as well. So if you can somehow give them like emotions where people will rally, kind of rally behind them, and I think that makes it for a better storyline. Um, because just having all the good characters and something that's blocking them is what happens a lot. But if you can have, like, why is this person bad? What happened to make him this way? And then, you know, then you can maybe get some sympathy for him and see where he's coming from. It makes more depth, I think. Yeah, if, you, if, if you notice so many bad guys or villains throughout the history of, of writing and theater, cinema, they're, they're all, in the most cases, they're there by necessity. Uh, you know, we always talk about history and, and where history comes from and the fact that you know, history is viewed through the victors. But what about the people who haven't won? You know, they have their perspective, as Mike just talked about, you know, where do they, where do they come from? And, and in my, my first trilogy, it's a, a conspiracy a thriller, the doctor, his name is Dr. Chase, he is forced to be evil as a result of trying to save his own family. So as the, as the trilogy continues through, he becomes a sympathetic figure, and in the end, you don't know what to do with him. And so many people have read the trilogy and said, you know, this guy's, he, I, I don't know what to do with him, he's a modern day Frankenstein. And so that's, that's what the trilogy's been dubbed, the modern day Frankenstein, even though when I wrote it, I was looking at him as, okay, so he, he, you know, he's an evil guy, he's doing this, you know, he's doing things behind the scenes, and he's causing such chaos, but in the end, the chaos that surrounds him is something that actually comes back to help everyone in the story. So it's a pretty cool way to do it. Heather, do you have anything to add about villains, or would you like to move on to heroes? And... 
Okay. Go ahead. Hero. Hero, you know what? Why don't you take the, the idea of the hero and an anti-hero and contrast the two because both of them are your are stand on the uh, on the right side of things according to you know the paradigm but there's a difference between the two and they're sort of fun to explore so maybe talk a little bit about the difference between a hero and an anti-hero in a story so a hero such as uh, Luke Skywalker would be seen as a hero uh, has a clear arc uh, if you the hero's journey if you're familiar with that is, is if you're not familiar with that I highly recommend that you look into it it's extremely helpful in your writing um, it has an arc that Dips and rises and dips and rises, um, and it's pretty standard. So they you know, leave what is what the known. They go out. They move forcibly out of their comfort zone, seek help, have conflict, meet the villain, work through the conflict, return home, and bring something of worth with them that they've learned along the journey to pass on to others. So that's a traditional hero's journey. The anti-hero is usually like kicking and screaming the entire time. I personally find the anti-hero more interesting than an average hero. Like I never, growing up, was like not a Superman fan because I just thought he was just too squeaky clean and kind of annoying, and I really wasn't that interested in him. Whereas as Batman, and was much more interesting to me because he was just grumpy all the time. And I just did not really want to do it. And all this internal conflict, and that to me is a more interesting character to do it. Um, Han Solo, the same thing, the bad boy, and, and then now the rise of female anti-heroes is, is wonderful. And then even their journey, not even like questioning whether or not is a hero totally necessary to make a story interesting. Like The Girl on the Train is a great book, great movie, um, carries through, there's is she a hero? Kind of? She's a mess, like through the whole thing, and you're constantly questioning what is going on with this character. But they, she does have an arc; she does rise up in the end, and, and then you find out that the whole time you've had um, an unreliable narrator in her, and you don't really understand what's happening to her until the very end, which I think is way more. I think the anti-hero is really interesting. I'm, I'm writing an anti-hero right now, and one of the things that when we explore the difference is that. Um, they may have, a, I, I think they all have to have a code though, or they, they dip into the villain category, right? If they don't have some kind, and it doesn't have to be a code that is like the law, it can, but it has to be something we can, as the reader, doesn't push them over into the villain side. Like, I'm going to ask these guys, my next question for them is to name their favorite hero, anti-hero, a villain, and why. But my favorite anti-hero is Dexter. I love that character. And I love him because he's really, I mean, he's a serial killer, for God's sakes, but he has a code, and we can kind of almost live with this code, right? If he only killed little kids or he did something really awful, we'd be like, he's a, he's a villain, that's terrible. But because he kills bad guys and he does his research and he has a code, we can almost bump him into that anti-hero category, and we are sympathetic with him. We don't want to see him really caught. That's the whole point. So I find those kind of characters interesting, but they have to have a some kind of a code that they don't cross over into the villain zone, in my opinion. All right, so I'm going to ask them. Yeah, please. Um, and a lot of times, too, you got to remember, uh, we always kind of know what the good guys are, but sometimes the villain is not actually another entity or being. Uh, like the perfect storm, who's the villain? It's the storm. Or in the movie The Martian, what's the problem there? It's the science to get to Mars to save... Um, his name, Matt Damon, um, to, to save him, or, or if there's a storyline where someone is is dying of an illness, there's your villain. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're doing stories. It doesn't always have to be like Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. It can only it can be something else. And those different situations have their own problems and have their own backstories. It works that way too. Okay, so favorite. Villain, hero, or anti-hero, from pop culture, from books, from whatever, and and why? What did the writer or you know or director or whatever do well with that character that makes them your favorite? In whichever, um, you know, good guy, bad guy, or in between. You can start. Go ahead. All right, I'm a Star Wars guy, so this is be I didn't know that about you, Mike. <laughs> um, obviously, the villain is, is Darth Vader. He's he's just he's a perfect, you know, bad guy. And, you know, you know, you just wonder, you know, what could have been better with, with him if 
three quotes came out. But that's another story. Um, my favorite good guy was actually Han Solo, not Luke Skywalker, because he's not exactly the perfect righteous guy. I mean, he's the scoundrel um, and everything like that. So I think he's better, personally, than, than Luke Skywalker. And what was the other? You can run it through all, just whatever your favorite. Those two. Those two. You can, you can do villain, hero, anti-hero, one, all, whatever. Just if you have a favorite from your personal. I'm a huge Tolkien fan, so for me, I think Smeagol ends up being a, a character that you know a lot of people don't know what to do with. You know, he is a villain, and he causes so much mischief and chaos throughout the entire uh, you know storyline of the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings, and you know he fits into so many of the different stories. But yet, at the same time, you know he's really been forced into this role. Uh, by a number of different things, and of course, yes, maybe because of his own curiosity and, you know, who he is as an individual, but then as you continue to read through, you find that his uh, akinness, I guess you would say, to the Hobbit itself, and then they even, you know, when they're sharing their uh, riddles together, and they both kind of sit there and have that aha moment, where they're both sitting there going, Wait a minute, you know you know those riddles? What? And you know the answer to that? And even in the end, Smeagol is just so frustrated and upset because he can't get and and you know get the, him to be stuck on these riddles. So for me, he's he's my ultimate villain. And then in terms of a hero, I I'm just a huge Skywalker fan. <laughs> and just you know, just watching him, you know, grow from a young man into, you know, this Jedi master. Although we could talk a little bit about how he was portrayed in the last movie, because I'm not really a big fan of that. But you know, being <laughs> that's a Jedi another master, panel entirely. So, well, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking to one another um, yes, about this very subject. So, but you know, just him in terms of you know his gift and what he was able to do with his gift and learn his gift and then try and teach it to other people. And as a teacher myself, it's a very difficult thing to pass on that knowledge to other people because once you give that knowledge to other people, you can't really know what they're going to do with that knowledge once they have it. Uh, I'm going to go with anti-hero. That's my bag. <laughs> um, and definitely Game of Thrones, Tyrion Lannister is by far my favorite anti-hero. Uh, mostly because there's a lot of alcohol involved and being half Irish and growing up with a lot of alcoholics I can totally relate to that and understand that and see people just struggling and um, the fact that he he was a code switcher which I realize now is like his ability I mean yes he was a white male but he was also disabled physically disabled and treated horribly um, but learned how to move in different circles, which is what his skill was to be able to talk to different people on different levels and see people from a different point of view, which was like his little shining like, strength that he had. And once he like recognized his own strength to rise above that and move up through the ranks, clean himself up. I like that. I like the underdog. I like seeing someone come from nothing or come really low and then have a better arc. But I think, I don't know, like Luke Skywalker was just shining for me. I just right away and then just whining. <laughs> I just couldn't say that. <laughs> we really do have some great dinner time conversations oh, yeah. this little group right here. <laughs> that that was back to Luke. Just <laughs> the There's no whining better. in Star Wars. <laughs> this sister's no crying. This sister's better. Okay, so since we're talking really about character development, um, I want to ask these guys, when you're building your characters, your main cast of characters, what um, what's your process for doing that? Um, and what kind of answers would you know about your characters? What kind of little things would you know about your characters that you might not even share with the audience, but it helps you to um, color them in in your own mind, so that when you're writing it, because here's the thing: when you're when you're when you're writing a story, you don't want to info dump. I say this in every panel probably that I'm ever on, but you know, you as the writer know far more than you're ever going to deliver to your audience and your readers. And so, but if you have it up there, you're able to sprinkle it in strategically and with relevance throughout your story. But we all, I think, have talked about the fact that we know it first and we know it all. And Mike talks about the iceberg. And you can mentioned that but in terms of like let's take that into character building what are you doing in your mind to bring these characters to life what questions are you asking 
about them in your head? What do you know about them that may never come out to your readers but matters? Um, so I, I do goals when I write. Like I really have like what goal do I want to accomplish with my characters and like what do they hope for them to achieve? And then there's motivations that rise from that. So like if they have a goal, then what, what will motivate them towards that goal? And then I know like what the backstory needs to be like, starting from there. So if I say like this character really wants this, I have to figure out why do they want it? Like what made them come to that point where they're, they really need something? Um, my villain changes from book to book, so the first book it's it's one woman and she's Nomia and she's harassing this other young um, woman in the book uh, who's human. Nomia is the evil mermaid in it. In the second book, they work together, so you know, like the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. And then in the third book, we realize it's it's really like it's Nomia's mother that's kind of driving this whole thing. So it was like for me unfolding like who's motivating who. And realizing like those backstories that like, Nomia had this horrible life and this is why she was acting in certain way. Like building those behaviors in, like people are just not born bad. And this I love Maleficent. I loved because I was a kid, Sydney Beauty was one of the was the first movie I ever saw in the theater when I was four years old. And I was terrified by her, but like completely like she was just so beautiful to me. Like she had that beautiful stark face and the horns and then like yeah, grew up and then the, the movie came out and I was like, why is she so bad? It turns out like she's treated pretty horribly and her wings were ripped off. So like that's, that's pretty wretched. Like so now it like explains everything. And I I love going back and finding out why. Why are people like that? What was the turning point in their life? So having a backstory and having notes on a backstory, I guess, is my motivation for development. I'm an illustrator as well as an author, so I'm a very visual person, so when I'm looking at my characters, I'm visualizing them in my mind, and I kind of go backwards. I, you know, when you were talking about you love the underdog, we all have issues as people, and I always start with the issues, I always start with the problems, and, and I think about how interesting some of these issues, you know, you're talking about all the the drunks and how she adds all these cool things in there and then you know these people that have all these issues and these problems then you know a reader can really identify with that they can identify with things that have come up and problems they've had in their own past and then all of a sudden you can identify with these people and, and kind of lock on to these characters because I think all of us can write glowing things and easy things about our characters but you know, can we figure these people out? Can we make them a little bit more complex and complicated? So I kind of work a little bit backwards. Yeah, I think the um, you as the writer, uh, you know your characters. They they just pop into your head. You know what they they're gonna do. You know where they came from, and you know their stories. And you don't always have to bring that out to the, the reader. Um, and like uh, Tabitha had said, I always refer to that like an iceberg. So you give the audience. Uh, the tip of the iceberg, and that's only 10%. So you keep the rest of it to yourself, so at some point you can drive the storyline by going back to somebody's backstory, or there's something in their past, and you can bring that out. Um, case in point, in my story, one of the rangers, uh, Murdoch, is, he's always sarcastic, he's always edgy, he's always um, quick to, you know, to, to get upset. And you don't know why, you just think that's the way he is, but in reality, his backstory is when he was 15 years old, his alcoholic father burst out of a bar and his mother and his younger brother were there and he was making a racket and he startled a horse-drawn cart that the horse took off, ran over his brother and killed him. That would make you pretty edgy and upset and, you know, and he went off at 15 years old and never looked back. You don't see, see that in the book. I can use that at another point to explain that on another journey that I want to use in some point. So, you know everything about your characters, and you can just spoon feed the audience a little at a time. So if you don't give everything up front, you always have a reserve to work for. And I would say, when I'm developing my characters, I'm just gonna, because I agree with everything they've said, 
I ask myself certain questions about each of them, and, and, and they're sort of like interesting questions, like would they make their bed in the morning? Could they leave the house with the house untidy? Uh, um, are they thrill seekers? Would they be a character that would jump out of a plane or go on a roller coaster or not? And I'm kind of trying to build that S, that essential quality of the character, um, so that I know those things about them. But then now what you're doing is you're taking that character with this personality that you've built and this history that you know that they have, and you're moving them forward in time and throwing things at them from your plot that are necessarily going to change them and impact them. And so it's really fun to see, okay, if this person normally would be like this, but you've just tossed them into another situation, how does that make them change and evolve? And you know, what's an authentic response from them because you've, you've built their personality and then what are they going to do when it's something unknown or unexpected? So um, let's check the time here because I want to make sure we have time for questions. All right, so let's... If we don't have questions, I have more questions for these guys. We can keep the conversation going, but it always is interesting because you, you seem to want to, any audience that we have seems to want to ask some things. They have some stuff they want to clear up about their own writing or want some advice, and we're happy to give it. The only thing that I ask of you is that you please keep it in question format um, and that you ask one question at a time, and if I have time, I can come back to you if you have more than one. So don't be shy or I'll have to go to my plants here in the front row. <laughs> Okay, see, see when you bring your mom, she gets a question going and warms the room up. Yes? Yes, mother. As a mother. Oh, I'll, I'll repeat it. I can hear her. I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Challenge. Writing from, well, that's not really about characters or character development. I'll say writing from, it's. What's the okay? So the question was, what's the process when you when you're writing and you're working from home? What what are the challenges? Um, the challenges are for me that both you have all the time in the world, and then it seems like you have no time, um, and you have to be really really structured with your life, and you have to build a schedule, and you have to build a, a professionalism that comes out of almost a non professional setting, which is your house. So that's what I would, I would say to that. Okay, you warmed up the room. I see a lot of hands over here. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, do, you, do you think that it's important, or maybe you don't care, or maybe I, like, for me as a reader, I find characters that are compelling when they act in ways that, like, people in, in real life kind of behave as well. Like, maybe extreme for, like, a superhero villain. Yeah. But there's a, like, it's not a character who's, like, acting out of character. But like, what do you do when you have a character that is an extreme character, and they're like, you know, they're driving the plot, and their sort of character development is driving the plot, and they're kind of like fantastical, but not fantastical in fantasy, but they're just so extreme in one way, but they're still believable. Like, like for example, like the cartoon Beauty and the Beast guest on. He's like a very over the top, over the top character. Gotcha. And we would never believe that someone like him exists in real life, and yet he's such an interesting villain in that story. So I, I, I think um, one of the best movies that I I liked was the um, Batman: The Dark Man, uh, Dark Knight Rises, and the reason why it's so good with the way the Joker's played and the way uh, Bale plays Batman is during the movie, you know, it's you know it's. Batman, it's joke, the Joker and stuff, but you forget it was done so well that they just seem like normal characters. And I think even though they're very extreme, they were done so well that you believe it all the way. And I think that's something that you need to do in your storylines. Uh, like, I have fantasy, I have dragons, I have warriors. They're, they're not like us, they're a little stronger, they may be magical abilities, but as long as they're not like, if I jumped off a hundred foot cliff, I'm gonna die. If my character jumps off a hundred foot cliff, he's going to die. If you let them all of a sudden fly away, well, you better have a good reason why. So even though you may have extreme characters, try to keep them as real as possible. Keep them in those lanes. Like one of the, um, it was the second Star Wars movie, uh, was it The Clone Wars? Attack of, Attack of the Clones. And in the beginning, it was, they were on Coruscant, and all the cars were all you know, flying around the city, 
in Obi-Wan and Anakin when jumping from one to the next, down, 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 flat. Like, all right, I know they're Jedi, but come on, you got to have a little bit more. The, the rules weren't right, because all of a sudden they were like Superman. And then, oh, he's just using a force. So our world building you know? panel that we do all the time, we talk about when you create a world and you, you create... Um, rules around your magic or around your characters. I think that applies to character personalities and arcs too. You're creating something so you they can do surprising things, right? And you can have surprises happen and you want to, you know, you, you almost want those aha moments that you should use sparingly, of course, but you don't, you, your readers can't be like, nah. You want the response to be, wow, oh, oh my God, that was so cool or that was so interesting. Oh yeah, all right, I can see that happening. And I'm, and I'm I'm intrigued by it, but not like, no, you know, like them hopping from, car, you know. So Gaston is Gaston, and we believe him, and when he acts boisterous, it's okay, because we've, we've, we've suspended our disbelief to come to the story with you, as long as you keep your story true to itself, if that makes sense. If I could add to that, like, Gaston yeah. is like a stereo, like, he's... Because it's a cartoon, like you can get away with with that kind of loaded stereotype of like he's this big macho male that's just boisterous and loud and full of himself, a narcissist. Um, and because it's a cartoon, like you have to pack all that in. But I think if you're writing a novel, it becomes different. Like you can have a, a narcissist, but you have the breath to like do it slower and and loud, but in a more subtle, more relatable way, I guess, than with a cartoon where it's more. You gotta pack it all into one small thing to get that vibe. Like his size, his magnitude, you're just using words, you're like describing him, how you would do it. It would be, I think, a little bit more to not turn your reader off and be like, what a cliche. To do it well, you have to have a lot of subtleties. Like, would you all agree with that? Yeah. Well, writing, I mean, it's a different medium when we're watching, but you still are bringing people in and asking them to suspend their disbelief that there's a mermaid. Yeah. Or that there's a dragon, or that there may be aliens. You know, you're you're still asking them to suspend their disbelief, but you have to draw them in. And I think in writing, like Heather said, you have the opportunity to draw them in a little bit more slowly and believably, almost. Yeah, and whether and whether or not you are a villain or a hero, you start as someone. You start as an individual, and you know, as you are building those characteristics around that individual, then you start thinking about their problems, their issues. And then, of course, then as you're starting to build that, then you start to get into, okay, well, what, does this person have a power? Does this person, uh, you know, do they have magic? And then we get into the world building process of, well, are we going to make it believable? But then you get into the point where you're like, wait a minute, this guy's so out there, is he believable? But you did, you did, you did have to start with an individual somewhere, and then you build around that. Keep, keep it as real as possible. <laughs> Did you have a question? I saw your hand up before. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. About the anti-hero and sort of like use it really about being the anti-hero has to be good. Even the anti-hero has to have a code. I don't know, there's some anti-heroes that I have to be honest. Well, what I would ask then is are they an anti-hero or a villain? Because if they cross a line too often or too much or with something that the audience or reader doesn't can't follow over, they, they cross into the villain realm, right? So I guess my question is, um, do you have to be overt that they have this code, or do you think that someone is more subtle that they're more motivated? I kind of feel like they're the No, right, he has his rules. Heather actually has a great anti-hero in her book. So, why don't you say a little bit about that, because she's she's just so relatable, and it's not like a list of things I will and will not do, but she's definitely not your typical um, heroic, and yeah. so right, talk a little bit you. about that. Uh, Alright, so Evie McFagan, Evie Rounds with Heavy, starts off with this, she's a funeral director, alcoholic, mother, um, and she just doesn't think much of herself at all and like you start the books with her being like she's just a hot mess and like she doesn't have really self-esteem and she doesn't really care either which is a common thing like when you find with people that you see like that person has no self-esteem and you see like 
they act like they don't care, but really they do. Like, they're, like that's a, a defensive wall, like being funny or being, you know, being the funny fat friend or something like that. Like if you haven't seen the, the new movie that just came out, um, Brittany Runs a Marathon, was wonderful. It was the same thing about this girl who's just like, she was sick of being the sidekick. She was sick of being like, I'm the fat friend that's funny. And she had built that wall up to kind of hide the fact that she did not love herself. And so Evie does not love herself in the beginning. Um, she does love her daughter, but she's not acting right. Like, and her husband's kind of like, he's shouldering the parenting in the beginning. Um, this, when the villain comes in, the evil mermaid that she encounters and she starts investigating, like, what's going on with this evil mermaid, she starts to realize, like, she does have work, like, that she's, that there's some, there's something driving her to, like, follow this woman around. And it's what like, starts off as curiosity, but then it becomes something more as she goes through. And then you start to realize, like, over the course of all of the books that, like, she was horrible, like, had this horrible childhood. And, like, that's why she is the way she is. And then there's also, like, sort of something in her family's past that's kind of fueling her instincts towards the mermaids, and that goes that way. So then, as she starts to believe in herself a little bit more, um, her arc changes. So she starts to, like, hey, you know, like, I, okay, I can do this. I can save the world. <laughs> I don't think that speaks to antiheroes too need an arc, right? They yeah. have to change over time and their motivations are, you know, that sort of thing. So. And this code that we keep talking about, you know, it could be a matter of circumstances, but it could be a matter of subject matter too. Uh, because being a military person myself, you know, having, you know, served during the time where the Cold War was ending, and having, you know, sit down meals with Soviet soldiers at the end of the Cold War and kind of comparing notes and looking at each other and deciding, you know what, guess what? We're all soldiers. We all have the similar and same code, but for, for years and years, we viewed the Soviet soldier as the enemy. But they had a similar code to myself, but they were viewed as the villain and were viewed as the enemy. But when we sat down and talked to them, we found that we had so much more in common uh, Besides the fact, you know, what our generals were telling us and propaganda and everything that we were talking about, you know, who's good, who's bad, what's, you know, what's the villain. So it could be that type of code when you're reading that, uh, especially, you know, in some of the military components that I write about, you know, they're all similar in nature because they have, they're following their orders. But at that time, who's giving the orders and what are the, you know, one set of orders looks like it's good. The other set of orders looks like it's something that could be evil. So, like, how how do you know, like, that you're 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 writing a hero or an anti-hero? Because you can have heroes, like like the example you brought up with the girl on the train. You can have a hero that's uh, uh, unreliable and troubles, but they're, in the end, they're still pretty much the hero. So like, like, how, like, so how how do you know like you have a hero who's like maybe not always yeah like you have the hero that's troubled and maybe makes a mistake or does because you can't I mean your hero can't be perfect right so even your your right. heroic character I think it's that I don't know you guys can chime in too but I think it's that uh, that in I don't I think it's more subtle really I mean I know when I sat down to write my first series that my my heroes were heroic. And that, that I was going to portray them as heroic, they, their jobs were heroic, what they were asked to do was heroic, they behaved, um, in some cases they were tested and did have to do things that in, in the regular world you would say, well that's awful, but you're, but it was wartime rules, you know, essentially. So they were forced to do things that maybe aided their soul and changed them, but, but I knew that going in that that was more of a heroic thing. The book I'm writing now is she's really an anti-hero, she's an assassin. So they're, they, but yet she's got a code and she's got a good heart and she only, it's a, you know, I mean, so. Well, the line is like, the, what's not socially acceptable? Like, right. so if, you're, if your hero is doing things that are not socially acceptable, that's an anti-hero, in my opinion. I, don't even I think that's a hero. good, I think that's a good start, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good point because if you watch the series The Boys, that's exactly what they look at. Right. You know, they look at these superheroes and then all of a sudden you actually look into their lives, you delve into their lives and they don't look as super now because you know you're, you're looking behind the curtain at the wizard, so to speak. I think the socially acceptable piece is, is part of it, right? You know, because on the surface, 
you know, an assassin shouldn't be a hero, right? But yet what she's going to go do throughout the story is going to show her inner intrinsic goodness. Um, and then, you know, and a villain could be just the opposite, but so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like a, a regular hero can have, should have flaws. Right. You know, we're all a flawed hero and an anti-hero are. Yeah, but they're, they're very close, but if, like, if you're a regular hero and you have flaws, it's different. Like, if you do things that are, like, completely socially unacceptable, you tip in the scale to well, like Han Solo was a smuggler, right? And yeah. he, you know, but yet we knew at the end when he came and in. And he shot that, Rita first. And he shot first, you know, so. But in the end, he came through with doing the right thing when it mattered. And is it that, you know, that quality of him. So I, I think you're right. It's been, yeah, where do they? Yeah, I mean, well, that's it. I mean, I'm not being snarky with the shot Rita first. It's like, that's why Lucas changed it, because he did not want Han Solo to be seen that way. He wanted to change history, which is not appropriate, and say that Han Solo was always, always a wonderful person, and he wasn't. Like he had killed someone, and he did not want that going forward. So he edited it, but we all remember it. We do remember. <laughs> Any? That was a good question, though, because I think it, it, it. Yeah, you know it when you see it, though, right? Kind of. <laughs> We have a couple more minutes, so if you have one more question, otherwise I'm going to toss them another question because I have one. Uh, okay, mom. <laughs> Main character. She stayed the course, but. Um, so yeah, again, I will. I'll start with you know, like you build a character in your mind, and you know all these things, and you've created the backstory about them. So then, but now you're putting them, you're plopping them into a moment in time where probably something really bad is happening, or something chaotic, or something that will inspire change. And then you sort of like test them and see where they come out on the other side. I didn't want her to. I wanted her to stay heroic, as I wanted Derek to mostly stay heroic. But I wanted to show the um, the the wear and tear of being at war for so long and you know for the so I had to show her making some choices and decisions throughout there that she never would have made if she hadn't been you know backed into a corner and yet the, you know her, her fundamental quality of, of soul I think or whatever came out in the end so um, yes I had a picture of her yes I knew she needed to come out battered but still someone you loved at the end yeah yeah I think with, with all our characters, and um, all of us have books that are in a series, and we all started off with, okay, I have a really good character in this story, but then we go, we keep going, and you know, you bring your characters with you. Like, when I wrote, I knew kind of where I was going with the first and second book, but when the third one came, it just started coming out of my head, oh, this is where it needs to go, and then the fourth one. So you don't really know exactly, you know what your character's gonna do right from the get-go. But where, it, where he ends up, but here she ends up, that's the fun part. Yeah. I don't even know sometimes. I'm like, I'll be writing, and I, I, I always go with an outline, so I know they're going to go to this next point. And then sometimes just go off on this really good tangent. I don't know. One day I'm just writing, and I'm in the flow, and it really works. So sometimes you don't know where your character is going to end up. It's just the way it goes. Oh, I'm here. I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, a lot. Why did I choose to make an unlikable character? Um, just more interesting to me. I, I find character I, I, that's a personal choice, like that I didn't. I, actually, I'll tell you the truth. So, um, I wrote this story, I wrote a short story, and Evie was the main character, um, and she was just average, you know, not ugly, not pretty, not, she was just an average stay-at-home mom, and she went to the playground, and she encountered this mermaid, and then I read it to my husband, and he was like, eh, I'm sorry, and I was like, alright, what's the matter? He's like, she's just kind of boring, and I was like, she is kind of boring, and I, at the time, I was reading the True Blood series, the by Charlene Harris, and I was like, oh, you know, Suki Stackhouse is very attractive, but at the same time, she was kind of flawed, and I was like, well, I like flaws, so let's give her a bunch of flaws, 
<laughs> and I made her, I made her, I was like, well, no one really, my, well, my grandmother had died at the time, and there was a funeral director, and she was drunk, like, at the funeral. <laughs> And it was great. Like I just like I loved watching her try to keep it together and like some of the things she did, her hands were shaking, and I was like, that can't be a fun life, you know, like you're around dead people and mourning people like all the time. Like you probably need some coping skills to do that. And I was like, Whoa, what if she was a drug funeral director? That's even better if she's in kind of movies. And it just made it like it, it cracked me up. And then I was like, Well, if you were like that, like what how would you feel about yourself? Like probably not that great. Like just being in that environment all the time would be a lot of work to keep it together. And I, so she kind of developed that way, like, and that's why. Yeah, I, I mean it's funny because like I've done over fifteen book clubs with her, and there's always a woman that was like, I just hated her. Like I just really hated her, and I was like, okay. And it, it's almost like I, I wonder, like, how much are you like struggling with not accepting who you are? Like they're like, I don't feel good about myself, and I'm trying to get through this. And here she is; she doesn't feel good about herself, and like, she's a mess. And like, she's unapologetically a mess. Like, she just like, eh, I don't care. Like, I don't feed my child. I don't pick her up at at the, <laughs> at the babysitters. I I have no like. And you're, as a mother too, that's hard to watch someone fail at parenting. Which I like that twist of uncomfortability. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I think that's it for us. It's time, but thank you all for stopping by. We're at, at table four hundred and something, four, four, fourteen, four, fifteen, and four, five, seventeen. Five, seventeen. We're kind of right in the same region. If you'd like to come talk to us some more, thank you.